Hello and welcome to another lecture in Western Civilization. We'll be talking this time about Mussolini and the emergence of Italian fascism. If the Bolshevik Revolution and the establishment of the Soviet Union was one product of the Great War, representing one pole of the ideological repercussions of the Great War, the rise of fascism, first in Italy and then in Germany, was the other. Although proto-fascist ideas had circulated in Europe since the 1890s, it was only in the wake of the Great War that fascist movements would emerge to challenge the established liberal and conservative order, and establish the other great pole of the ideological conflict of the interwar years, the fascist right versus the socialist left. In this lecture, I'm going to turn to Italy in the immediate post-war years, to the emergence of Benito Mussolini, who would create in the 1920s the first fascist state. Benito Mussolini was born in 1883, and he had become a revolutionary left-wing journalist before the war. At the age of 29, he had become the editor of the most important socialist journal in Italy. He distinguished himself very early on, and certainly in 1914, by advocating Italy's entry into the war. Most socialist parties before the war had been officially pacifist. The Italian Socialist Party certainly was. In 1914, there was considerable concern on the part of the German government, the French government, and in 1915, the Italian government, that socialist parties would adhere to their socialist ideology, their commitment to pacifism, and not support the war effort. In Germany, and then in France, the socialist parties, however, had bent with a nationalist wind, blowing in 1914, and ultimately supported the war effort. The Italian Socialist Party, on the other hand, had never really endorsed the war. It would remain true to its principles throughout the war era. Mussolini on the other hand, as editor of this influential Italian socialist paper, was from the very beginning an advocate of Italy's entry into the war. Indeed, during the war, his thought took an increasingly nationalist turn. He had, in addition to agitating Italy's entry into the war against Austria, Mussolini would demand the seizure from the Habsburg monarchy of the so-called Italia Irredenta, or the unredeemed Italian lands, particularly along the Adriatic. During the course of the war, Mussolini would serve as an enlisted man, and like other Italian nationalists, he was outraged at Italy's treatment at Versailles. Italy had suffered over a half a million war dead, and yet emerged from the Versailles settlement with only minor territorial gains, very little from Austria, nothing from the dismemberment of the German colonial empire in Africa or from Turkish possessions in North Africa. In 1919, 
Mussolini would organize his first paramilitary organization, the Fascicio de Combattimento, and would make this organization his stepping stone, his springboard to national prominence. Mussolini would begin his political career as a non-socialist in an environment that was highly conducive to radical politics. Italy, at the conclusion of the Great War, suffered serious social and economic problems. An economic depression and high unemployment in the cities and poverty and hunger in the countryside. All of the European economies took a downward dip at the conclusion of the war, and Italy was no different. But in Italy, with the end of the war, the old liberal government was returned to power and just seemed somehow out of touch, seemed unable to manage. The situation wasn't helped in 1919, when Italy adopted a new system of proportional representation. Before 1919, the Italian government had been based on single-member districts, relatively small ones. After this electoral reform in 1919, this system of proportional representation, which was developed in order to give a greater voice to various opinions, greater democracy to the people. This system made coalition governments necessary. It would be very difficult for any one political party to achieve a majority, and yet made creating such a coalition politically difficult. Now, Italian politicians would be forced to craft together, to cut and paste coalition governments together out of a system of proportional representation. The Socialist Party, meanwhile, stalked out a radical course that seemed to echo the situation in Russia. As we've seen, the socialists in Italy had never endorsed the war and now advocated a Bolshevik solution for the Italian problems. One of the things about the situation in Italy after the war that is particularly important is that Italy's involvement in the war had been quite controversial. After all, in 1915, nobody had attacked Italy. Italy had not been part of, they'd certainly been part of the Central Alliance, but the Germans and Austrians had not counted on Italian participation on their side. They were not involved in the Schlieffen plan, not involved in the mechanical operating of the alliance systems. And so, in 1915, when Italy did enter the war, it was a conscious act that, as a great state that is a major power in Europe, Italy sought to become involved. It was also lured in by the promise of certain territories in North Africa, by the English and the French. Nonetheless, Italian participation in the war had been a controversial issue. And, given the enormous losses suffered by the Italians during the war, and the little tangible gains made at Versailles, that controversy would continue after the war. The Socialist Party made very little effort to mobilize veterans. In 
to tap this large potential constituency of returning veterans. And indeed, its attack on the futility and meaninglessness of the war effort certainly ran afoul of Italian national sentiments. In 1920, the Italian Socialist Party supported a wave of national strikes and regional work stoppages, urging workers to seize factories. Indeed, the Italian Socialist Party seemed to be following a scenario derived from the Italian, uh, from rather the Russians. By 1921, as the situation deteriorated, large landowners in the south and factory owners in the north were hiring bands of demobilized soldiers, some who called themselves fascists, to protect their factories. Gangs would attack socialists traveling by truck out into the countryside to assault labor leaders and to burn union halls. The liberal government in Italy seemed absolutely ineffectual in dealing with a polarization of politics that was emerging in this post-war environment. Indeed, the social unrest on which much of that was based seemed to be completely beyond the pale of the liberal Italian government to cope with. It was in this very fertile situation that Italian fascism would take root. In this situation that Benito, Benito Mussolini and the fascist party he would establish would find a growing constituency. The appeal of fascism was directly related to this post-war situation of disorder, of economic despondency. Mussolini promised a return to law and order, to end these seizures of factories, to end the violence on the streets of Italy. He condemned the land seizures in the countryside, condemned the socialist unrest in the cities. He postured, and Mussolini was marvelous at posturing, postured as a bulwark against Bolshevism, and posed as a defender of the nation. Now was the time, he argued, that Italians should pull together to build a nation and not be torn apart by class conflict. His street organization fought with communists in the streets, pitched battles in the major cities of northern Italy, and evicted legally elected socialist municipal officials. There was a kind of Wild West atmosphere in Italy in the early 1920s, which mightily contributed to this atmosphere. The black shirts, as Mussolini's streets organizations came to be called, because they wore black shirts, broke up strikes and attacked union halls. And Mussolini called on Italians of all classes to join with him in a nationalist crusade, not only to restore order in Italy, but to restore the grandeur of Italy, to have Italy assume its rightful place as a major world power. He attacked conventional politics and called for a transformation of Italy, born of its wartime experiences. And this really is the social dynamic and the model for politics 
that Mussolini would use and would also very heavily influence Adolf Hitler and the Nazis in Germany. So much of their social model of the way society should look, their view of the way the state should look, was heavily influenced by the experiences of the First World War. We talked about the war weariness everywhere in Europe. Uh, there was also the horror of the trenches, the terrible experience of combat during the First World War. But there was another side of that experience that would be drawn upon very heavily by the fascists. That was the sense of the solidarity of the trenches, that Italians, Germans, and others thrown into the military, thrown into this community of the trenches. It wasn't important whether you were from southern Italy or northern Italy. It wasn't important whether you were rich or poor. It wasn't important whether you were a good Catholic or an agnostic. The key that was there was an Italian national community present within those trenches. That it represented a kind of egalitarianism, the egalitarianism of the trenches. The fascists would make as part of their social ethic. There was an enormous appeal in the immediate post-war era, when the dislocations caused by the war and the demobilization at the end of the war seemed to accentuate class conflict, to accentuate differences all over Europe. As we will see, not simply in Italy, in Germany, in France, and in Britain as well. There was a tremendous appeal to a great many people about finding a way to overcome these class differences, these divisions within society, and to work together. The fascist solution was to perpetuate the spirit of the trenches, to perpetuate the egalitarianism of the trenches. What was important was to build a national state based upon being an Italian. That had been present. That was the experience that so many people had experienced in the Great War. In this sense, what fascism represents or builds upon is an inability of many to mobilize psychologically from the Great War. The military aspect of things, the uniforms, the black shirts, the militarization of the organization, all have their origins in the Great War itself. So the war, just as it would exacerbate tensions in Russia and lead to the Bolshevik Revolution, would lead in other places and would be viewed by others as the model for a new kind of society, a new social ethic based on overcoming division. In 1922, in October, as the Italian government limped from crisis to crisis, unable to bring the situation under control, still beset by factory closings, by strikes, by seizures of farms in the countryside. Mussolini's black shirts, in a symbolic reprise of Garibaldi's red shirts, 
and their march on Rome in 1859, began a march on the capital to seize power in Italy. The Italian cabinet, rather than confront the black shirts, simply resigned. And Mussolini found himself, to his great surprise, appointed premier of Italy. He demanded and was granted emergency powers for a year. Mussolini in 1922 was surprised at the ease with which he had found himself suddenly catapulted into power. There was, despite the bravado of Mussolini, if one thinks about the public appearance of Mussolini, one sees him almost standing on the balcony in Rome, addressing an enormous throng, quite literally pounding his chest. Mussolini was fond of showing his vigor, his manhood, by literally ripping off his shirt and pounding his bare chest in public. Despite this bravado of the latter era of Mussolini's leadership, in these early days, Mussolini was cautious, torn between a desire to work now within the state, which he found himself miraculously in charge of, and under pressure from more radical members of his own fascist party. In 1924, he was able to manipulate the electoral laws in such a way that the fascists would win a very significant victory. And 1924 would also be important for another reason. The Matthiotti affair in the summer of 1924 would mark a major turning point in Mussolini's career, and in the Italian state under fascism. In June of 1924, the moderate social leader Matteotti was assassinated. He had just made a speech in the Italian parliament denouncing fascist violence when he was set upon by fascist thugs and murdered. The murder of Matteotti provoked widespread outrage in Italy and abroad, provoking many to call for Mussolini's resignation and some sort of special inquiry set up to establish responsibility for the outrage. Mussolini's initial reaction was for himself to take a moderate course, to assume responsibility, to say, yes, this is excessive. He certainly didn't endorse it, but he was urged by others within the party to use this as an opportunity to press for the establishment of genuine fascist control. Mussolini, with these two courses before him, chose the latter. He chose to use the Matteotti incident to solidify his control and to radicalize his government. On January the 3rd, 1925, addressing the Chamber of Deputies, Mussolini not only accepted responsibility full responsibility for the Matteotti incident, but for fascist violence more generally. Indeed, he announced on that day his determination to bring about an utter transformation of the Italian state. Now the time had come for the fascist revolution. 
he began in 1925 to consolidate his power. He reduced the Italian parliament to a position of virtual powerlessness. He dissolved the labor unions and declared strikes illegal. He abolished all political parties except for his own, and he arrested opposing leaders. He denounced democracy as a sham, weak or historically irrelevant, already crushed under the wheel of history, that liberalism had been the wrong turn for Europe. And now the time had come to reverse course and put Italy on the true road to progress. He proclaimed himself leader, or El Duce, the leader, and created a network of fascist social organizations for women, youth, all kinds of sporting organizations. One sees in Mussolini's Italy a development that would be followed by the Nazis in Germany. That is, to establish not only a system of the police to oppress potential political enemies, but also to establish a network of social organizations that would literally carry Italians from the cradle to the grave. Fascist organizations for women, fascist bowling organizations, fascist singing societies, choral societies, fascist opera leagues, established by the regime to reinforce the notion that fascism was everywhere, that it was central to Italian national identity. Mussolini would argue, and it would become a staple of fascist thinking throughout the interwar years, that both liberal capitalism and Marxist socialism were merely two sides of the same coin. Echoing the anti-modernist thought of the 1890s from people like uh, Marat in France, uh, Julius uh, Langbin in Germany, he argued that liberal capitalism and Marxist socialism were both based on Enlightenment thought. They both were rational, materialist, cold, mechanistic. They both were based on the idea of class conflict. They really represented the narrow class interests of specific groups within modern society. And therefore, some third way must be found. Parliamentary democracy, he said, didn't really represent the people. What it really represented was the special interests of capitalism or organized labor. And therefore, democracy was a sham. What was needed was some new socio-political and economic force that would represent a third path. And this is what fascism was supposed to do. Beginning in 1926, he set about establishing a corporatist economic structure based on the idea that instead of the idea of one person, one vote, that representations would be based on professions, on occupations, 
all professions or economic sectors would be divided into 22 corporations. Don't misunderstand this. It's not corporations in a business sense, but rather of estates in the old pre-industrial era. So that all occupations, all economic sectors, would be divided into 22 corporations. In each group, fascist dominant, uh, fascists would dominate the representation. They would dominate labor and the state, which would cooperate to determine wages, prices, and the conditions of labor. In this way, you would eliminate class conflict. You would eliminate the divisions that were destroying modern industrial society. A national council of these corporations would then coordinate economic policy for the country as a whole, with a view toward making Italy self-sufficient. In some ways, it seems like a return to the old guild structures of the old estates of corporations. Tied to this notion of everything for the nation, everything, as Mussolini would say, for the state. This system was intended to eliminate social conflicts, but it hardly did that. It managed, however, to repress them, to push them underground. One social historian talking about the situation in Germany, but it applies to Italy as well under fascism, described social conflict as watching men fight under a blanket. On the surface, everything seems okay, but underneath, you can tell that there's great conflict going on. The system of corporations was not completely finished until 1939, on the eve of the Second World War. Nonetheless, there was a great deal of interest, just as there was in the 1920s and the 1930s, a great deal of interest in the social ex in the Soviet experiment. So too was there a great deal of interest in this corporatist solution to the problems of modern industrial society. Mussolini and his regime would publish campaigns such as the Battle for Wheat, in which he talked about it being a national objective to have the harvest in intended to demonstrate the cooperative nature of the new system. There was no real advance made. However, under this fascist economy, no fundamental reform, especially in the countryside. Nonetheless, Mussolini enjoyed a remarkably good international reputation during the 1920s and into the 1930s. Good international press for apparently having created a system that functioned. A system in which, as the saying went at the time, the trains ran on time. He was the darling of many conservatives in Western Europe for his stalwart stance against Bolshevism, against communism. His determination to make some form of market economy work. His determination to halt labor unrest. Mussolini would call 
for the establishment of what he called a total state, a totalitarian state, in fact. But in spite of this call for a total state, Mussolini would recognize the Italian monarchy. One of the remarkable things about his regime in Italy was that the old monarchy continued. Victor Emmanuel would remain king of Italy. There would be no attempt to abolish the monarchy. At the same time that Mussolini was declaring himself El Duce, the leader, the head of this total state, there was, in fact, a potential for the rallying of conservative opposition against the regime. The monarchy remained in place. And more important, in 1929, Mussolini ended the decades-long dispute between the Italian state and the papacy. In 1929, Mussolini signed a concordant and the so-called Lateran Pact with the papacy, restoring the sovereignty of the Vatican and conceding church autonomy in education and supremacy in Italian marriage law. This concordat, and then the Lateran Pact, was tremendously popular in Italy. The liberal regime had been at loggerheads with the papacy since Italian unification. This action on the part of Mussolini was intended to, and did, win the support of the Italian peasantry. Also, the signing of the concordant by the Pope seemed to suggest recognition, indeed support, of the Italian state under fascism by the papacy. This won Mussolini great support in Italy and abroad. This apparently orderly system, a system that seemed to withstand the rigors of the Great Depression, stood in stark contrast during the late 20s and early 30s to the situations of the Western democracies. France, Britain, and even the United States. Indeed, Mussolini seemed successfully to have mobilized Italian nationalist feeling to create a vigorous, strong, and self-confident Italy. A far cry from the previous liberal Italian regime. A far cry from the troubled Third Republic of France or the infinitely traumatized Weimar Republic. Indeed, in the 1930s, Italy would enjoy a tremendous international reputation, as would Mussolini. In the 1930s, so confident was Mussolini of his position at home, so confident was he of his international reputation, his position in the international community, that he was able to launch a grandiose plan to re-establish, as he put it, the Roman Empire in the Mediterranean and in the Adriatic, leading to foreign policy adventures that ultimately would drive a wedge between him and the Western democracies and lead Mussolini into the arms of his ideological comrade, Adolf Hitler, in Germany. In the early 1930s, then, at a time when democracy seemed to be challenged everywhere in the West, Mussolini had established an alternative sort of regime, an alternative to both what appeared to be virtually everywhere, the weak, vacillating, and incompetent democracies of the West, and in stark contrast to the Soviet experiment in Russia. This was to be the contribution 
of fascism in the 1920s to the international situation and its influence and impact on Hitler and the German fascists, we will see in another lecture. But for now, that'll do it. Thank you.